fresh chaos in the 2025 F1 driver market as seats we thought were locked down at Mercedes and Red Bull were seemingly coming back into play. I think we can see now why a decision that looked quite straightforward for Carlos Sainz may be a little bit more complicated after all. I don't think I remember a driver market as volatile or as chaotic as this. So many fresh curveballs keep getting thrown at us. I've got Scott and Ed with me to unpick all of this. Let's start with the Mercedes curveball. It looked a few weeks ago like Kimi Antonelli was basically a lock to replace Lewis Hamilton at Mercedes in 2025. But suddenly, some mixed messaging coming out of Mercedes. So has Toto Wolff gone cold on Kimi? I don't think he's um, gone completely off the idea as such. I think it just <laughs> it reflects reality. Um, Mercedes would point out that with Sainz, for example, that it, it never closed the door on him. And with Antonelli, it never 100% committed to putting him in the car uh, for next year. And obviously, while this has played out and the season's gone on, Antonelli's having this difficult F2 season alongside Haas 2025 driver Oli Behrman in a Premier team that hasn't quite got on top of the new car. On top of that, in terms of pace issues with the team, Antonelli's had some racecraft issues, some race execution issues. So Mercedes wants to give him as much time as possible. That has always been the plan, to give him the whole F2 season if, if needed, to show how he's developed as a driver. At the same time, Mercedes' position is changing as well because obviously they're on a much better trajectory. So I think Wolf has not change the messaging too much. I think he's reiterated why this was a decision that they wanted to spend as much time waiting to see where the lay of the land was. The stakes have become a little bit higher for Mercedes ultimately because a few months ago it would have been risible to suggest Mercedes could be a championship threat next year, but their recent progress suggests that they really could be. And so there's a bit of a difference between throwing an 18-year-old into a team that's trying to battle its way back to the front and one that could be in a real life championship battle so that's maybe skewed the equation a little bit and of course there's the question of whether Antonelli feels he's ready whether those behind him think he'd be better served with a slightly more phased introduction to Formula One. And I guess this is where science comes back onto the Mercedes radar then but I thought you know he wasn't interested in being a Mercedes plan B. I think there was a little bit of the science camp feeling that a driver of Carlos's experience and reputation and the fact that he's a race winner shouldn't have been contesting uh, with Antonelli for the seat and maybe should have been a bit more of a lock than, than he was. An understandable uh, so position, can't... basically, I think, given yeah, what he's done. So maybe there's a little bit of, you know, respect maybe is not quite the right word, but the way that it's been handled, maybe the signs is we're hoping that there'd be a bit more of an emphatic, we want you, we need to have you, let's do a deal. Now, Obviously, uh, being at Mercedes in the short term or just for the short term doesn't massively appeal to Signs, but I think he's always had, uh, he's always been open to a deal that sort of gives him a, a chance to sort of make his best case there and then try and stay longer term. But he doesn't want to go anywhere just for one season. I think the best way to put it is that if Mercedes is not quite going cold on Kimi, but wants to give him a little bit more time, then maybe there is a an extra year in F2 and a Williams apprenticeship, or just a two-year Williams apprenticeship for him that gives signs a more medium-term Mercedes future. And if that happens, that deal becomes, I think, a bit more favourable to both sides, and it's worth the wait. And frankly, even a suboptimal move to a team like Mercedes for Sainz is a positive, even if it only gives him one or two years in a front-running car. It's very, very hard to get into a front-running Formula One car. He's in one now. Most of his main options that are there to be taken that he could have signed up for any time in the past few months are not good options. They are teams down the wrong part of the grid. He might go down there and never come back. So it makes sense for science to hold out if there's a realistic hope. He doesn't want to ruin other chances, but he can afford to be a little bit of a risk taker when it comes to hanging on he's done that before but because of this ever shifting chaotic market he keeps getting to the brink of that saying well I've got to accept something to thinking oh well maybe there's a possibility of staying at the front I've got to hang on for this yeah it's worth pointing out that the uh, lack of signs options is best summed up by the fact that the Renault works team has only become more appealing since it decided it might not be a works team anymore <laughs> that's how that's how moribund the options are for signs and even you know Williams boss James Vowles who is one of the people trying to get him to sign a piece of paper and drive for his team has admitted that he feels sorry for signs in the situation he is so you you can't blame Carlos for running down the clock and just desperately hoping that something better appears yes yeah, science seems to be in the most chaotic position of all at one stage his options are shrinking now they seem to be expanding again if you remove the science shaped cork from the midfield morass bottleneck which is what we're talking about now 
that in theory simplifies things, but actually you might end up replacing him with a Perez shaped court because obviously now there's the Red Bull curveball, a seat that Perez seemed to have locked down for one, maybe two more years might be coming back into play. So how does he fit into this new chaotic driver market situation? Well, if Perez is on the market, he's a very appealing option. Yeah, he's having a dreadful time. He's generally had a tough time alongside Verstappen, but he's a very experienced, very accomplished Grand Prix driver. So he would be of great appeal to a number of those teams. We don't know exactly who would look at him, but if you're a, a Sauber Audi or someone like that, or even an Alpine, you'll be thinking, actually, Sergio Perez could be of interest. And that's before you even factor in the fact that he can be quite positive commercially as well. So there's a lot of ticks in the Perez box. So there will be an effect on the market. Obviously, if Liam Lawson gets into some kind of Red Bull machinery, that removes him as an option for other teams as well. So that's why this market's so bizarre, because options that seem to be set and locked down are suddenly coming back into play constantly. Yeah, the Lawson one's interesting because I thought hearing that he was a, a serious Audi Sauber backup is quite strange because I thought, you know, they were more interested in drivers like Ocon or even incumbent Valtteri Bottas. Well, I think the situation that they found themselves in is that they were so confident for so long that they would get signs that they've been a bit passive in the driver market in terms of alternatives. I know that there's been contact with Lawson on that side. But the only way he becomes available is, is if Red Bull decides, no, he's not good enough for either of our teams and we don't want to put him in one of those, which doesn't say a huge amount about Audi's F1 project if that's the kind of driver you're going for, someone who can't get in one of two teams that, that Red Bull owns. But Lawson's he's a reasonable upside driver. He's not a Formula 2 star in the sense of you know recent graduates like Oscar Piastri or George Russell, Charles Leclerc, Lando Norris, etc. But he did enough as, as Ricardo stand in last year to get, I think, a proper chance in Formula 1. And when you then combine that with the fact that Audi doesn't seem sold on the alternatives, that's why he ends up being quite a prominent player in their considerations. You know, the relationship with Bottas has has called considerably and I think it would take a lot for, for Bottas to be convinced to to stay there. Ocon is a driver that they're interested in but not to the point where I think they'll go early to to, to snag him. He's probably going to end up at, at Haas and that's because of his reputation as a teammate, a difficult teammate, someone who clashes with people um, that share the same coloured car as, as he does. And Theo Porsche, who is a Formula 2 champion, Lawson can't say that, he's just never done enough to convince the Sauber side. And if he can't convince the Sauber side, I don't see how he can convince the, the Audi side. There's something about him either as a driver or the way he works behind the scenes that means he's in the equation as like fourth or fifth on the list, but he's not going to force his way into that driver lineup. Oh yes, Theo Porsche, driver I forgot to mention because the list of options for some of those teams, particularly Sal Rowdy, just seems to be growing exponentially. If Ocon's no longer really a serious factor on that list and is headed for Haas, what does that say about Ayo Komatsu's regime? Is he not concerned by this, I think, legitimate Ocon reputation for not playing very well with others? Well, I would point out that Komatsu, given he's been at Haas for several years, is well versed in managing difficult teammates because he, while he was on the engineering side rather than the team boss side, he knows the Roman Grosjean, Kevin Magnussen years of old and oh. how tricky that can be. There, there might be a little bit of, not naivety, I think that would probably be a bit unfair, but there might be a little bit of just kind of like, oh, it'll be fine, we'll ride out the difficult days because he's worth it overall, but... I think not to put words in, in, in Ed's mouth on, on, on camera, but uh, I like the suggestion. I think we've talked about it a few times. Ocon's just a better Kevin Magnussen. He's going to have higher peaks and he might drive into his teammate every now and again. But if you have Ocon alongside Oli Behrman, that's a great lineup for Haas going forward. He's such a brilliant signing for that team if they get him because he does offer such great performance. He will give you some great race weekends. We've seen what he's capable of. At his best, he's fantastic. Comes with a bit of a downside, but if you're a team like Haas, that's the kind of driver you want. Someone with that big upside. Maybe there's a few little weaknesses that mean they don't get a top team drive, but great for a team at that level. Yeah, well, Ocon, even if he has some challenges working with his teammates, he's a race winner, isn't he? So you can see how that's an appealing upgrade for Haas. And of course, if they now have their lineup pretty much sorted and you've got Behrman and, and Ocon pretty much locked down. That's that's meaning we've got a huge pile of drivers basically fighting over two or three seats. You know, if the Antonelli and the Science to Mercedes thing happens, you're basically talking about two seats and a, a huge amount of drivers. So who's going to end up getting shoveled out of F1 next year among that big pile? 
Well, that's a good question. I think of drivers on the grid, Kevin Magnussen, there's a tiny chance he could hang on if, if Haas don't really knock on, but I think that's going to happen. So Magnussen seems to be on the way out. So does Logan Sargent. So does Joe Guan Yu in terms of uh, a race seat. Valtteri Bottas, I think, is in quite a good position because he's of interest to pretty much all of those teams in the second half of the grid. A narrowing position, though, isn't it, for him? It is, but when you're an option for everyone, there's a good chance you'll come in. The one thing he has to be careful of is if you're everybody's second choice, sometimes they all get their first choices and you end up stuck. So he's keen to sign a uh, contract, but I think Bottas should be okay. He's got a lot to offer for a team, particularly given he's kind of the opposite to the Ocon reputation in terms of the way he works with other drivers. So he, he offers a lot. Jack Doohan obviously is hanging around at Alpine. He was getting quite confident about getting into that seat until suddenly there was this pitch for Carlos Sainz. So if they don't get Carlos Sainz, Jack Doohan could have a good chance of stepping up from reserve driver there. So he's in, in quite a good position. Perez is that curveball. I'm sure he'll end up somewhere if he's on the market. So there's probably the key question of who of this this kind of selection of drivers who aren't necessarily perfectly placed to come in, Doohan, Pusher, people like that, who will be on the grid. There'll probably be one who's a little bit disappointed, but there's actually about the right number of seats to go around for the number of people who should definitely be on the grid. Let's put it that way. But like we say, chaotic. There could be yet another curveball around the corner, probably 10 more the way it's been going. Yeah, it's worth pointing out that we've, um, going back to the point we've made at the start with these Red Bull Mercedes seats, that has, it's not just us that have been caught out by that. It has completely changed how the main players in the driver market are behaving. It was not that long ago, and I'm saying this as, as recently as the Austrian Grand Prix weekend, where everybody in the paddock was was aware that it was edging towards a likely outcome of something like Sainz goes to Alpine, then Bottas is at Williams and Ocon's at Haas. It ties it out quite nice, ties it up quite nicely. Lawson maybe replaces one of the Red Bull drivers, but we don't know. Doohan misses out and, you know, a, a Porsche doesn't get a look in. Pretty straightforward. But you throw Antonelli into a different seat, Sainz into a different seat and Perez on the market, and all of a sudden everything blows up again. But it could also just snap back to where it was. These things are still in a state of flux, and that's what makes it so interesting. And remember, this all goes back to that moment Lewis Hamilton signed for Ferrari. That took a lot of people by surprise. Immediately, the rest of the driver market kicked off, and it hasn't stopped kicking off ever since then. 